Again, welcome to the 15th annual Alice Connor Gordon Memorial Lecture. As your program notes, Alice Gordon was a professor of economics here at Oakland University throughout the 70s and the 80s, and one of the earliest members of the School of Business Administration. She was, in fact, the first female faculty member in the SBA. Alice earned her PhD in economics from the University of Michigan, where she was a student of Professor Morris Bornstein. Alice Gordon made her mark as a scholar in the area of Soviet studies, as the Dean mentioned, and we are pleased that she spent her career here at Oakland as a gifted teacher and a very generous faculty mentor. I would now like to introduce to you our 2006 Gordon lecturer. He is Dr. William A. Darity Jr., who goes by the name Sandy to those who know him well. Dr. Darity earned his undergraduate degree from Brown University and his PhD in economics from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He presently holds the title of Boschamer Distinguished Professor of Economics at the University of North Carolina. He also serves as research professor of public policy studies, African and African American studies and economics at Duke University. He is a past president of both the National Economic Association and the Southern Economic Association. Dr. Darity will address us today on the topic growth, trade, and uneven development. I gathered at lunch that his presentation will take an historical perspective for those of you who like history. It is our great honor and privilege to have him with us here today at Oakland University. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in giving a warm welcome to the 2006 Alice Connor Golan Memorial Lecturer, Dr. William Sandy Darity. What produced what Asimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson have called the first great divergence that made Western Europe markedly richer than Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, and most of the Americas. They asked this question in a paper that was recently published in the American Economic Review in the June 2005 issue, and I found this to be a very, very interesting paper, and, uh, and I'm going to talk about it uh, at some length today. I want to give you a sense of the magnitude of the divergence that exists in the world today. If we think about a measure like gross domestic product per capita, if we were to look at the 2003 data, we would find at one end of the spectrum a set of countries with extremely high per capita incomes. The United Kingdom, for example, over $27,000 per annum. France, closer to $28,000. The Netherlands, $29,000. The OECD countries taken collectively, $25,915. The high income OECD countries, $30,181. And if we were to take the United States alone, uh, the United States' per capita income in 2003 registered the highest of all the countries listed, uh, $38,000. The other end of the spectrum is a set of countries with considerably lower per capita incomes. For example, Pakistan with a per capita income of 2,097. India, 2,892. Guyana, $4,230. The country of Nigeria, $1,050. Uh, Venezuela, about $5,000. Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, about $6,000. The Russian Federation, approximately $10,000. All of these countries were at least in the vicinity of having about one third of the income of the richest countries, and in the most extreme cases, uh, their incomes would be 20 to 30 times less. The developing countries taken collectively, $4,359, and the least developed countries, $1,328. So real extreme differences in per capita income measures. Now, you might 
argue that per capita income doesn't really tell us much about the quality of life in peoples in of peoples in different communities or societies. A country like Sri Lanka, for example, uh, has a fairly low per capita income, but because it has an institutional history of having uh, a, a national health insurance system, actually has relatively good numbers with respect to infant and child mortality. Uh, it also actually has a very highly educated population relative to the per capita income of its population. But uh, we might not want to stay with per capita income as our indicator of disparity. We might want to try something else. And that something else could be uh, an instrument like the Human Development Index, which has been developed by the United Nations, which not only takes into account differences in per capita income, but also looks at life expectancy and educational differences as other indicators of the quality of life. So it's an index that takes all three of these factors into account. But again, we're going to find significant disparities between the countries that are richer on the per capita income scale and the countries that are poorer on the per capita income scale. So for example, the United Kingdom on a scale of uh, max, maximize, maxing out at one, the United Kingdom had uh, a, a human development index score of 0.94, as did France, as did the Netherlands. The OECD countries collectively had a, a human development index score of 0.89, and the high income OECD countries 0.91. In sharp contrast, a country like Pakistan had a human development in index score of 0.53, Nigeria's was 0.45, India's 0.6, Guyana 0.72. Uh, countries like Brazil and Venezuela and South America, 0.80 and 0.77 respectively, but you would have to think very carefully about those countries and examine differences in the human development indices for their white and non-white populations, which are substantially different. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, 0.79. The Russian Federation, approximately 0.8. Interestingly enough, those human de development index scores are similar to the human index scores that you would calculate for the African American population of the U.S. if you did a separate calculation for them. Very different from the overall human development index for the United States. Uh, developing countries collectively, 0.69, and the least developed countries, 0.52. Anytime you talk about scores that are below 0.85 or so, you are talking about something that we might characterize as a developmental deficiency or a developmental disadvantage in terms of the performance of these countries in the provision of, of, of sustenance and a quality of life for their citizens. Now, the question I want to address with you today is how did these disparities come about? What were the processes that generated these differences in, in economic and quality of life performance across these countries? Now, Asimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson contend that between 1500 and 1800, Western Europe experienced a historically unprecedented period of sustained growth. And it is that period of sustained growth that they argue set that region apart from the rest of the world economically. It's an economic apartness that was transported to those countries' colonies of settlement in contrast with colonies of occupation, particularly in terms of the quality of life for the settlers. Now, what is the story that they tell about what happened between 1500 and 1800? In some respects, it's a story that's very reminiscent of Adam Smith's ideas. They describe the rise of Western Europe being attributable to the growth that occurred in countries with access to the Atlantic Ocean. So foreign trade is central to their story. And in particular, trade that took place with the New World, Africa, and Asia via the Atlantic Ocean. They argue that there was a direct effect of this trade, a stimulus that took place as a consequence of this trade. But there was also an indirect set of effects that they invoke, institutional changes that took place in the countries that were most actively engaged in this Atlantic trade. First, they argue that there were limits placed on the power of the monarchy, 
which in turn contributed to, contributed to a strengthening of the merchant class, which in turn led to the introduction of regimes where property rights were well respected. Smith might have argued that the property rights protections came first and then the benefits from trade, but they have trade stimulating the institutional changes in their argument. The transatlantic trade thus becomes a big ticket item for Esimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson. It is an institutional argument that says that regimes which move towards non-absolutism did better than those that made maintained absolutist rule by monarchs. So, for example, they say Britain and, ne and the Netherlands, which moved towards non-absolutism, did very, very well. Spain and Portugal did not do as well, ostensibly because they remained absolutist. Okay? So, I'm going to take another step here, or another angle. I'm going to argue that if you want to invoke the significance of the transatlantic trade, you must talk about the slave trade and slavery, particularly if you are talking about the interval leading up to the close of the 18th century. The British, Dutch, the Spanish, and the Portuguese were all major actors in the slave trade, as were the French. But the wealth extracted by Spain and Portugal was transferred to Britain. And I'm going to argue that it had absolutely nothing to do with whether or not Spain or Portugal maintained absolutist political orders. The British simply knew how to be the best at conducting mercantilism. In fact, they're the best the world has ever known. Indeed, as a consequence of running substantial trade surpluses with Spain and Portugal, and Portugal in particular, there was an enormous specie inflow that took place into Britain. Approximately $50,000 worth of, I'm sorry, 50,000 pounds sterling worth of bullion from Brazil's mines came into London on a weekly basis during the height of the period in which Britain was running substantial trade surpluses with, with per Portugal. Uh, indeed, these trade surpluses were so significant in terms of their impact in bringing gold and silver into England that there was a substantial addition that took place to the British monetary base, having a credit multiplier effect and leading to the expansion of finance on a scale that was unprecedented. Further, the British engaged in military operations that resulted in the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Remember the famous line about singeing the King of Spain's beard? British then gained control of the high seas and the trade routes. And indeed, if we were to think that the political institutional explanation that, uh, that, that Asimoglu and his, his co-authors emphasized was so important, we could, uh, we could ask, why didn't Britain grow very rapidly from the signing of the Magna Carta? And it certainly didn't. So Asimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson give special attention to the indirect effects of this transatlantic trade. I think the direct effects are far more important. And I think that they give an emphasis to these indirect effects because they simply didn't read enough of the literature on the subject. I'm going to talk about that literature. And, and somewhat egotistically, I'm going to talk about my own contributions to that literature. So bear with me. Okay. So th they, saw, they say the following in their paper, and again, this is a very recent paper. They say, the evidence weights against the most popular theories for the rise of Europe, which emphasize the continuity between pre-1500 and post-1500 growth and the importance of certain distinctive European characteristics, such as culture, geography, and features of the European state system. Instead, it is consistent with theories that emphasize the importance of profits made in Atlantic trade, colonialism, and slavery. Now, I would say amen to that, brothers. But then they say, nevertheless, other evidence suggests that overseas trade and the associated profits were not large enough to be directly responsible for the process of growth in Europe. And here they invoke the work of Stanley Ingerman and Patrick O'Brien, two economic historians of, of, of some significance. Uh, Ingerman is perhaps even more famous for a book that he wrote jointly with Robert Fogel called Time on the Cross, which was a study of, the, uh, of slavery in the, in the United States, which argued, and, and interestingly enough, this is in contrast with previous research, and I, I'm, I've always been astonished at this previous research, uh, previous research which suggested that slavery in the United States was not profitable. 
Okay. And, and Fogel and Ingerman, Ingerman argued that it was significantly profitable and you know, otherwise it probably would not have been sustained as long as it was uh, and would not have required a civil war to bring it to an end. Uh, okay, so Ingerman uh, made an argument years ago uh, about the railroads in the United States. He said that the claim that the railroads played a significant, uh, significant part in American economic development just can't hold because if you look at the profits generated from the railroads relative to the gross domestic product of the United States, those profits are very small. They're a very small proportion of, of, of GDP, so the railroads couldn't have been that important. Well, he transferred that same style of argument to an analysis of the impact of the slave trade and slavery on uh, European economic development by pointing out that in the British case in particular, uh, profits from the slave trade were a small proportion of, of, British, uh, of, of British GDP and therefore could not be that significant. And then O'Brien extended this style of argument to the run of European economic development by similarly arguing that the transatlantic trade that Europe engaged in during the period that we're talking about uh, was, was a very small proportion of the GDP of the various European countries and therefore couldn't be important. Okay? I, I dub this argument the small ratios argument. Okay. And I want to talk about the small ratios argument. Okay. So, uh, first thing that Stan Ingerman did was he constructed what he called overstated estimates of the profits earned from the slave trade by British capitalists. And then he tried to demonstrate that slave trade profits as a percentage of national income, as a percentage of investment, and as a percentage of commercial and industrial investment for Britain in several years during the 18th century uh, simply, uh, simply were too small to matter in, as, as an explanation for British industrialization. Now the first thing I want to note is that Ingerman's intentionally overstated estimates are limited to profits from the British slave trade. They do not encompass the entire returns from the trade as well as the returns from the colonial plantation system in the British West Indies. Okay, so he's, he's only looking at the profits from the British slave trade. Okay. Second, in light of more recent estimates of profits from the slave trade, it's not clear that Ingerman's numbers constitute a gross overstatement. But third, and this is much more important, it's not apparent that Ingerman's percentages actually are small in a historical or relative sense, despite their apparent absolute smallness. And let me point out that you can take almost any element of an economy's activity and, and make it the numerator when you make gross domestic product the denominator and you get a small number. Okay. So that's, that's the small ratios trick, but it's an easy trick because you can do it with almost anything. It doesn't tell you what functional role that activity plays within the structure of the economy. So does the number really look small in a relative sense? Well, in a critique of Ingerman's argument, Barbara Solo makes exactly such a point, and it's her paper that was published in 1985 is one of the papers that uh, Asimoglu and his co-authors apparently didn't look at. So she says, focusing on 1770, we find that Ingerman's overstated slave trade profits form one half of 1% of national income, nearly 8% of total investment, and 39% of commercial and industrial investment. She then says, these ratios are not small, they are enormous. The ratio of total corporate profits of domestic industries to GNP in the United States today, that's total corporate profits, not profits from any single sector, amounts to 6%. The ratio of total corporate domestic profits to gross private domestic investment for that year amounts to over 40%. And the ratio of total corporate domestic profits to 1980 investment in domestic plant and equipment, non-residential fixed investment, runs at more than 55%. 
How can we be sure that the ratio of slave trade profits to national income in 1770 is small at half a percent when the ratio of total corporate profits to GNP today is only 6%? If slave trade profits were 8% of investment in Britain in 1770, is that small when today total corporate profits amount to 40%? No industry manages as much as 8%. Is the potential contribution of an industry whose profits can only amount to 39% of commerce commercial and industrial investment be ruled out because it is small. Naturally, she says, it is not my intention to make a serious comparison between 1770 and 1980, nor to, de nor to claim that these figures make a case for Eric Williams, who I'll, I'll mention in a moment. Ingerman never claims that they measure anything but an upper limit on what the slave trade could have contributed to British growth. But on the evidence of his figures, this contribution could have been enormous. Okay. Now, who's Eric Williams? Well, Eric Williams is uh, the first in post-independence prime minister of Trinidad, who was also a historian and a scholar, who wrote a very provocative book called Capitalism and Slavery, in which he argued that slavery and the slave trade was central to British economic development and subsequent economic development of Europe. And it is Williams's book that Ingerman initially was challenging by introducing the variant of the small ratios argument that addressed the sla address slavery in the slave trade. Barbara Solo says she's not necessarily defending Eric Williams. I, I, I am, and I will proceed to do so. Okay. Okay. Now, it's, it's Patrick O'Brien who offers the best developed application of Ingerman's small ratios argument. He looks at the period of the Industrial Revolution, and he attempts to dismiss the importance of trade with the entire periphery, Asia, Africa, and the Americas, for European economic development. He marshals estimates of the shares of foreign trade and overall acti economic activity for all of 18th century Europe to show that the numbers are too small to give credence to the importance of trade of any sort as a critical engine of economic expansion. Now, presumably, European economic development, from his perspective, was predominantly an internal affair that would have proceeded if the rest of the world had not even existed from the 18th century onward. O'Brien points out that by the 1790s, the flows of commodities transshipped between Western Europe and regions of the periphery of the modern world system might amount to 20% of exports and 25% of imports. The bulk of trade by European states, according to O'Brien, was between themselves. He goes on to observe that the volume of all exports of European nations during the period 1780 to 1790 amounted to about 4% of Europe's GNP, with perhaps less than 1% sold to Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, and the southern plantations of the young United States. The proportionate volume of imports was a bit larger, but still small, according to O'Brien. Now, smallness in an absolute sense, as far as I'm concerned, still has nothing to tell us about the contextual or causal significance of Europe's trade with the periphery. In 1837, the German nationalist Friedrich List expressed concern about the misleading impression Huskisson, the British ambassador to the United States, had given while using a similar small ratios argument in the early 19th century. Here's what List said. Huskisson declared that the exports of the United States to England amounted to half her total exports, but that England's exports to the United States amounted to only one-sixth of her total exports. From this, he concluded that the Americans were more in England's power than England was at the mercy of the United States. This superficial argument may sound plausible, but every American farmer knows perfectly well the true nature of the Anglo-American trade. He knows that the exports of the United States to England are all raw materials that England cannot do without, and that the value of these products is increased tenfold in the manufacturing process. On the other hand, he also knows that all England's exports to the United States are manufactured goods, which the United States can very well do without, since she can either make such goods herself or she can buy them from France or Germany. Consequently, England is in the power of the United States in two ways. So if you don't consider the composition of trade, inter-industry linkages, and differential multiplier effects, O'Brien's small ratios are empty of content. Furthermore, ratios for Britain, the major economic success story of the latter half of the 18th century, were much greater than for Europe as a whole. Consider the following passage from O'Brien himself. 
For particular countries, external trade would be more important, especially for smaller maritime powers such as Portugal, Holland, and Britain, where ratios of domestic exports to gross national product probably approach 10% by the second half of the 18th century. But less than half of these sales overseas consisted of merchandise sold to residents of the periphery. Imports for maritime economies perhaps fell within a similar range of 10% to 15% of gross national product, again with smaller proportions purchased from the periphery. Plus, the British shares were moving in the proper direction to establish the significance of external trade, progressively upward. Total net imports, for example, rose from 10% of GNP in the 1780s to 25% by 1850. Furthermore, one can ask whether or not ratios of exports or imports to GDP or GNP of 10% and a ratio of 3 to 5% with a subset of trading partners, the periphery, are small. The statistical share of overall trade for Britain's economy in the late 1700s compares quite favorably with that of modern industrial centers like the United States and the United Kingdom itself uh, today. Uh, as well as such newly industrializing countries as Brazil, Venezuela, Mexico, Peru, Argentina, and the Philippines. Uh, ratios are about double what they were in the 1790s and similar to the ratios for the 1850s. Only South Korea among uh, recently industrialized countries uh, listed here has ratios well above Britain's in the late 18th century. Moreover, it's not evident that foreign trade is less important to modern Brazil or Venezuela than to the UK today uh, because their export and import ratios to GDP are smaller, particularly given at that point they had the obligation of servicing substantial external debts and the major way in which you get foreign exchange to service your debt, which is going to typically be denominated in a currency besides your own, is, is, through, is through exports. Now, admittedly, O'Brien acknowledges that the trade ratio data is not sufficient to make his case for the marginal importance of trade in general and trade with the periphery specifically. The more fundamental questions, he admits, are how important was capital formation for the economic growth of Western Europe, and did profits from trade with the periphery supply a significant percentage of the funds utilized to finance the investment required for economic growth after 1750? Uh, now, not surprisingly, his answers to these questions are negative, my answer is going to be positive. Okay. okay, so I'm going to put the second table up and uh, ask you to, to work through it with me. Okay. If you look at table two, entries A through C are all numbers that are based upon O'Brien's own estimates, okay? Those are his estimates. Okay. So that's for the period of time that he's examining. And they're specific to, to Britain. Okay. Entry D is a conservative estimate of profits from the slave trade that is predicated, among, uh, uh, predicated on uh, the most conservative numbers about uh, the estimates of the number of slaves landed in the New World during the course of, of the period in question. Okay. Okay. Now, note that the ratio of the total flows of profits accruing to British capitalists trading with the periphery alone to gross investment expenditures during that interval exceeds the ratio of total corporate profits to gross private domestic investment in the United States in 1786. Okay. So we're looking at the period 1784 to 1786 on the, on the left, and we're looking at 90, 1986 for the U.S. on the right. And if you, if you look at that ratio that I've mentioned, B over A is uh, total flows of profits to British capitalists engaged in trade with the periphery to gross investment expenditures at home and abroad by British investors. That's 55%. That's larger than uh, the ratio of F over E, total corporate profits in the United States in 1986 to gross private domestic investment, which is 42%. If you take the ratio of C over A, profits from commodities made or grown for export to the periphery, 
to gross investment expenditures at home and abroad by British investors. That was 12% in uh, 1784 through 1786 for Britain. Comparable kind of estimate, manufacturing profits to gross private domestic investment, 10% in the United States in 1986. And then profits from the slave trade as a percentage of gross investment expenditures at home and abroad by British investors, 3%. If we look at the profits of the motor vehicle sector, which is a sector that I presume is familiar to most folks in this area of the country, as a ratio to gross private domestic investment at the United States in 1986, it's about 1%. So profits from the slave trade as a proportion of investment expenditures in Britain in 1784 to 1786 is three times as great as the ratio of profits of the motor vehicle sector to gross private domestic investment in the United States in 1986. I would argue that even if you are talking about these small ratios as having some substantive meaning, Ingerman and O'Brien have grossly miscalculated the relative significance of these numbers. So small ratios argument, I would argue, doesn't work. And I would go further to point out that if Asimoglu and his co-authors had looked at um, a more uh, recent paper by Ingerman and O'Brien, would, they would have found that Ingerman and O'Brien actually concede that the transatlantic trade was very significant for European uh, economic development, even though they don't link it back to the slave trade. Um, and this is the key point, that the transatlantic trade was the slavery trade, that one has to reconfigure your thinking about this trade to recognize the centrality of the slave trade in this entire process. Now, why was it so central? Well, if you think specifically about the British case, the first thing you have to recognize is that there was a linkage to the shipbuilding industry and a linkage to naval power. Uh, one of the vital demand sources for ships was the provision of the slave trade. Similarly, the ironmongering industry was the sector that built the chains that were utilized for the purposes of keeping the slaves in captive position on shipboard. The products that were exchanged on the African coast for the purposes of purchasing the slaves gave a boost to the manufacturing activities. Uh, in addition, uh, the Birmingham firearm industry, the gun industry in Britain, was closely linked to the slave trade because one of the products that was exchanged on the African coast for slaves were, were, were firearms, creating what Josephine Corey described as a slave gun cycle. So you would, get, you would exchange slaves for guns, use the guns to procure more slaves, and then exchange them for additional guns. There's a slave gun cycle that, that developed on the... African coast. So we, we think of the Birmingham firearms sector. The Birmingham firearms sector was intimately related to the slave trade. Uh, the provision of clothing from the wool industry and the textile industry of Britain was also something that was linked to the demand for the provision of clothing for slaves in both North America and in the Caribbean. There was an effect uh, a symbiotic relationship across a multitude of industries that were linked together as a consequence of the operation of the Atlantic slave trade. And this Atlantic slave trade also produced uh, output from the Caribbean and from North America that was translated into final products once the raw materials were converted into other types of goods. So in the Caribbean, the Caribbean it was sugar. Caribbean were the, sh the Caribbean functioned as the sugar islands. What was sugar transferred into? Well, raw sugar was converted into processed sugar. And so you get the, the long tradition of drinking tea in Britain. And tea drinking becomes extremely popular after sweeteners are available. But you also have the production of rum as a major product, as an accompaniment to the development of the molasses sector. So sugar, molasses, and rum. Uh, and in addition, in North America, of course, the central product associated with slavery becomes eventually cotton. 
which is linked directly to the development of the textile sector, both in New England as well as in Old England. Okay. So uh, you could even describe this as kind of a hothouse effect in terms of the development of all of these industrial sectors that bear some sort of strong relationship to the slave trade and the slave plantation system in the Atlantic. So the transatlantic trade is not just a trade in the abstract that can be divorced from the use of human cargoes as captives and as, as objects of sale. Now the other piece of this story that we have to also think about is how this process of uneven development played out on the African con continent. And I'd like to talk briefly about the phenomenon of African backwardness and the imposition of a process of backwardness on the African continent as a consequence of the, the slave trade and slavery. Um, one of the most interesting studies that I'm aware of is, is Bio Holsey's use of a natural experiment to examine the effects of the slave trade and slavery uh, in West Africa. Uh, Bio is an anthropologist, but she, she, do, she, she did something in, in constructing this analysis that would be very close to the heart of many economists. And I, as I said, she, she used what we call a natural experiment, and I'll, I'll try and, and describe this in a, in a moment. She suggests that generally there would be an adverse effect on economic development in regions that become engaged in some way in the slave trade. Uh, because of, of two, types of, two types of consequences. First, you, you generate a high level of social insecurity in the region, which makes it uh, much more difficult to proceed with economic development or economic development rea related activities. And you also have a process of intentional underdevelopment that may be associated with depopulation. Okay. But she points out that the trade did not have a uniform effect on all regions of Africa. It had a negative and pr profound effect on a continental scale, but the extent to which those effects were negative varied by, from region to region. So here's, here's her, uh, her natural experiment. She looks at the country of Ghana, and she says, we know that the entire country was subjected to colonization. Okay? But if we were interested in trying to sort out the effects of the slave trade from colonialism, Ghana provides us with a very, very nice way to do that. Northern Ghana was heavily raided for the slave trade, and she argues that the effects are still present in that region, while southern Ghana was the region of the country that was more heavily engaged in the sale of slaves. Okay. And so by comparing northern and southern Ghana, both of which were subjected to colonialism collectively when Ghana was referred to as the Gold Coast, uh, she finds that she can, she can look at the, the particular effects of the slave trade over the long term. She points out that the Ashanti, who engaged to a large degree in the sale of, sale of other Africans as slaves, protected their own. They took on tributary states as sources of slaves. These tributary states were largely north of the Ashanti community, and that's where large amounts of the raiding took place. Indeed, a, a word was used to describe a northerner, uh, which is danko, which, which meant slave. There were great losses of life, social disruption. Uh, there was a social orientation that moved towards defense and protection, a decline in agricultural production and activity, a movement of the northerners to the hills to escape the slave raiders, which, uh, which distanced them from their conventional economic pursuits. Um, so what, what does she find is the case for comparing northern and southern Ghana today? She finds, for example, that three out of the 748 manufacturing industries in Ghana are in the north. She finds that although the national school rate of attendance is 58%, it's only 18% in northern Ghana. The three northernmost regions of Ghana in 1999 displayed a condition where eight out of 10 persons were poor where the national poverty rate was closer to 40%. So she says that these kinds of differences in regional performance are a display of a difference that is a long-term consequence of the operation of the Atlantic slave trade and produces underdevelopment in those regions of the world. 
So in a sense, what we are doing is historicizing the divide that exists between the rich and the poor, <coughs> and historicizing it in such a way that we focus initially on the long-term impact of slavery and the slave trade. That is the transatlantic trade. And secondarily, on the long-term impact of the process of colonialism. Indeed, uh, in, in, in what we now call the North-South literature, there is a tendency to try to theorize about why uneven development persists in the world. Some of these models start with the premise that there's no fundamental difference in structure between the regions of the world that become separate in terms of long-term economic performance. That initially, they have the same structures. But there's something that must be different about them at the outset. And one of the critical differences might be some initial small difference in per capita income, some small difference in the growth rate that becomes a grievous difference as time progresses. And so the initial conditions become very, very important in these models. And then we have to try to explain why those initial conditions are what they are. Now, in, in, uh, in a very interesting passage I, I'd like to share with you as I, as I conclude, uh, one, of, one of the economics profession's most, most profound and famous thinkers, Gary Becker, had the following intriguing observation. So that one of the things you can do with these models where you have similar structures across all parts of the world, but some, some small initial difference, is you can generate many different steady state outcomes, multiple steady states. And he says, multiple steady states mean that history and luck are critical determinants of a country's growth experience. In the formulation in his own particular paper, initial levels of human capital and technology and subsequent productivity and other shocks determine whether a country grows richer over time or stagnates at low income levels. Many attempts to explain why some countries and continents have had the best economic performance during the past several centuries give too little attention to accidents and good fortune. And then he and his co-authors go on to talk about shocks to physical or human capital as triggers towards particular paths. But these shocks, of course, by definition, are random events so that differences in economic growth are driven by luck. The story I'm trying to tell today has very little to do with luck. It has a lot to do with a systematic effort to utilize uh, the high seas, to utilize foreign trade, to utilize captive labor as a mechanism for building economic wealth and prosperity for some segment of the world's population. And that prosperity is still evident today. It is a prosperity that can be explained in its origins by the processes that I've described today, rather than by luck or mere good fortune. Uh, there's something systematic about all of this. There's something systematic about how it all began. And it's something that I urge you to give substantial thought to in your future understandings of the process of uneven development. I'll stop there. We hope that you have questions, and the questions could be about the historical aspects, or they could transport us into the 21st century <laughs> as we look at how China and India are progressing and other regions of the world. So please feel free for the next few minutes to direct your questions to Dr. Garrity. Yes. I can start with a question. Yeah. Um, Greece, Rome, the Aztecs, and Spain and Portugal also had slavery, um, but obviously didn't accelerate into or didn't lead the Industrial Revolution. What was it peculiar about the British slave trade? that allowed Britain, France, and perhaps Northwestern Europe um, to separate themselves from Spain and Portugal and everybody else? Well, it seems to me it must be slavery plus something else. Yeah, well, first, I, I want to separate the slavery that you associate with Spain and Portugal from the slavery of antiquity. Uh, I, I would argue that the slavery that takes place under the systems or regimes that are associated with Spain and Portugal is in the context of the growth of what we might want to call capitalism. 
but I certainly don't associate ancient Greece or ancient Rome with uh, a capitalist, a capitalist social system. So let, let me let me put those aside. Now, the argument I was trying to make was that the wealth that was generated from the use of slave labor in the Americas by Spain and Portugal was largely transferred to Northern Europe through the process of trade. That is, the intra-European trade leads to a position where Britain in particular is running substantial trade surpluses with, with, with Portugal and is able to obtain the, the specie that was mined in, the, in Brazil through, uh, through, through uh, Portugal's uh, endeavors to pay off their trade, their trade deficit. And so, uh, so you get the wealth actually shifted to Britain, which compounds the process of Britain displaying this accelerated economic growth in comparison with the rest of, rest of the continent. Uh, the Netherlands and France both do a pretty good job, in quotes, of doing mercantilism. I mean, mercantilism is inherently a rivalrous system. So that, and, 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 and from its own philosophical orientation, there are winners and losers, and if the winners win, the losers must lose something. So it's, it's, it's the Northern Europeans who do a better job at doing mercantilism than the Southern Europeans. And part of that is reflected in the success that Britain has in running trade surpluses, persistent trade surpluses against Portugal. So that, that's, that's my argument, that it, 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 it's slavery as, a, as an instrumental component of an effectively run system of mercantilism that is critical to Britain's success in this process, and similarly for, for France and for Portugal, uh, France and for the Netherlands, uh, not so for Spain and Portugal. They're not, they, they, they weren't good mercantilists. They didn't do it, they didn't do it right. right. Mercantilism's ugly, but it's effective. And, and, and so that, that's, 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 that's my theory of what, what causes the separation, yeah. Um, I understand your argument in terms of its impact on Africa, potentially Latin America as well, but I'm wondering about those regions of the periphery that were not incorporated into the Atlantic slave trade or the transfer of specie from Spanish and Portuguese territories where that uh, was generated through slave labor towards Northern Europe. How do you explain the uneven development of the rest of the periphery? So you're talking about Asia primarily? Asia, the Middle East, et cetera. Okay, well, the, the Middle East is not, is not really divorced from this process to the same degree because of the Mediterranean trade. Uh, so it, 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 is, it is in some way incorporated into this process, at least through the trade networks. And then there is a substantial trade that evolves with the Far East, particularly after Marco Polo's trips to that region of the world, uh, through the Silk Road, et cetera, between Western Europe and the Far East. But yes, I think you need a different story, and the story I would tell would focus on the later, uh, at, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a mildly later stage, the colonial relationship that develops between many of the uh, Far Eastern countries and, 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 and the Western European countries. I mean, I, I certainly the Indian case is transparently one in which you can make an argument that colonialism is a critical agency in generating underdevelopment. Uh, the Indian textile industry was well developed and flourished, but was systematically destroyed by the British so that British textiles could be sold in India and throughout the rest of the world without the competition from India textiles, and that, that's, that's one example of this process of active underdevelopment that took place as a consequence of, of the colonial process. Yeah, yeah. A lot of us learned, like I did, to prefer Adam Smith to the mercantilism, and yet you say that mercantilism and gaining species uh, yeah. caused this huge growth, but how could it? You have... Uh, you it, have it causes species, it by... It causes species it... Species in the country it, have inflation. Now, well, sure, you can have inflation, but the question becomes, does, does the inflation outstrip the production that it stimulates? And in this particular case, it didn't. I mean, and, and indeed, the, the critical thing is that the specie constitutes an addition to the monetary base. And as I said, that can lead to a credit multiplier effect, which means that more finance is available to stimulate additional production and expansion in the country. And I think that's precisely what occurred in the British case. 
Species, you know, the, 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 the old Smith view about the sterility of additions of species or, or fascination with gold and silver is a very different perspective from arguing that the inflow of species constitutes a, a significant addition to a, a country's monetary base. Yeah, I, I, my argument is that mercantilism works. It's hard to buy it. <laughs> well, uh, but, but why? I mean, why well, is it so hard to buy? It works. So many opportunities for investment, and just because you have more cash doesn't mean you have more opportunities for investment. Well, the opportunities for investment are linked to this exploding trade that is triggered by the development of a plantation system in the Americas that utilizes captive and enslaved labor from Africa. It's a hothouse. I, it really was. Yeah. There is an alternative explanation, I think, that... that well, yeah, sure, there always species, is. Well, with species, it, it's the curse of oil. It's the curse of all natural resource extractive economies that Portugal and, slave, I mean, Portugal and Spain yeah. used their ships, yep. their capital, and their, their, their slaves yes. to extract gold. Yes not to create manufacturing industries. They were rich because they had specie. Right. And Britain, like Japan, without access to gold, um, created manufacturer's goods to trade for gold. Right. And it, it, it's sort of Adam Smith is right in that the, the problem with Spain and Portugal isn't that, that Britain's a better mercantilist. It's that they engage in sterile activities. activities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that. that I, I could buy that interpretation also. Yeah. yeah. That was the point I was going to make. Certainly, as you contrast, yeah. the, the U.S. runs a trade deficit. Yeah. Japan runs a trade surplus. Try recasting what you're saying in the context of is a trade deficit a bad thing? We enjoy a high level of consumption here. Right. As the Portuguese and the Spanish were, because they had the wealth. They have to do something with it, so they buy consumption goods. Yeah, well, it's, it's a trickier issue than that, though. There's, uh, there was a debate in the literature about the Anglo-Portuguese trade, which is, which is kind of interesting because that's the example that Ricardo uses uh, to, to make his case from comparative advantage. Uh, but there, there was a debate in the literature in the 1970s in which uh, one argument was made that um, that, that Britain's capacity to obtain specie through running trade surpluses was simply attributable to the fact that uh, British products were so much preferred in Portugal. Okay, so it was, just, it was just an outcome of the normal trading process. So there was, uh, but there was another argument that was made that there was actually a systematic effort on the part of the British to keep Portugal from developing a manufacturing sector. So that there would not be a substitute for the British products, so that there could not be an import substitution kind of strategy that was being utilized, and as a consequence, they could continue to run these surpluses. And uh, one of the one of the Portuguese rulers, Pombal, actually attempted to develop a manufacturing sector in Portugal, premised on these kinds of arguments about the disadvantage that Portugal was at, but he wasn't successful in doing so. And so uh, Portugal become. You know, it, it's, wine, it's, it's wine and cloth. <laughs> uh, but unlike, unlike, the, uh, unlike the, uh, the Ricardo analysis, the dynamic effects of these pro this process appears to be heavily disadvantageous to Portugal, even if... Uh, a, uh, differences between uh, developed countries and underdeveloped countries can be... But one aspect of it has to do with uh, the technology You know, I, th I think I agree with you. I think also it's, it's, it's not entirely a consequence of the precise wording of these types of uh, arrangements, but there's the cumulative effect of already having an extensive and well-established R&D apparatus 
And so uh, you know, th those countries that already are heavily engaged in substantial research and development activity are going to have an advantage anyway. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 think, I think that the, uh, there, there are arenas in which there are tremendous opportunities for some of the developing countries to build and design new products, uh, particularly making use of, uh, of native plants uh, the, the, the tropical based research utilizing native agriculture uh, and, and native plants, uh, potentially for medicinal purposes in many cases, uh, is, is extremely vast. But I think, yeah, I think that the existing order of, uh, of regulations concerning intellectual property rights does create some barriers to, uh, to not only fully, fully developing those products, but actually being in a position to market them internationally. So you think this is an opportunity for uh, leveling some of these differences? Yeah, I, I, potentially it could. I, I'm, I'm not sure it would uh, overturn these huge per capita income disparities, but yeah, I mean, certainly it, <laughs> it, it could potentially be helpful. I, I absolutely agree with that. Yes? Well, I don't know if you can rewind. I mean, you can always you can always uh, do a counterfactual, and you can say, well, you know, suppose suppose there was this high volume of trade, but it was trade in something else, uh, but it wasn't. So, 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 I yeah, you 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 might be right. I just don't know. I mean, I'm I'm really trying to unpackage what I see as the narrative about what took place, and. And there were indeed a host of ways in which the specificity of trading in slaves linked to a number of other industries which developed. I mean, I didn't even talk about the financial sector of Britain, where the very development of the insurance industry was closely related to the process of insuring the ships and their human cargoes. Uh, I mean that, that's also how a lot of the growth of the insurance industry in the United States was attributable to providing insurance policies for, uh, for planners who owned slaves. So yes, there could have been a different history, but this is the history we have. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what you mean by the I other mean, thing around. You kind of talk of it from terms of origins, but it seems like there must have been something going on before that. Europe wasn't well, my, my, my origin point is really Columbus's voyages to the New World. Okay, so I'm, I'm really thinking about approximately 1500, you know, and the world after 1500. And one reason that's my origin point is that some of the evidence we have is that there wasn't. There, before that, that point, before this process gets underway, there's not any evidence of significant differences in, in, in agricultural productivity anywhere in the world. You know, that uh, there's a study by uh, Shahid Alam in which he tries to demonstrate that the world was fairly evenly undeveloped circa 1500. Now, of course, there were great civilizations that existed at previous points in history, but if we were to take the world at the point where Columbus's voyages get underway, uh, we don't see on the best evidence that we have available vast differences or vast disparities in per capita income across countries or in agricultural productivity. And so, so that's, 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 that's my starting point. And I'm, I'm trying to ask, so, so what happened after Columbus's voyages that caused this separation. And, and I would argue that what's central to understanding this separation in performance is the inauguration and execution of the slave trade and the development of the slave plantation systems in the Americas. So I don't, I don't know if that answers what you're asking or not. Well, it gives me more of an idea of where, where, you're where my starting point is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah.
business to Mal, business services, as you point out, insurance and so forth. Yep. Um, that spurred development of business, per se. And the second thing is that, unlike Spain and Portugal, which basically dug out the ground <coughs> yep. in the New World, British slave trade was essentially industrial in nature. It, it built capacity. I mean, hmm. you, you may not like slavery, nobody does. No. It, it was like bringing machinery. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's that's the story I would tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, are there lessons from your uh, examination of history to, to the future in terms of the kinds of changes that could be implemented both by the developed and underdeveloped uh, nations in terms of what kinds of things can serve as catalysts to reducing the disparities in, in future growth? <laughs> yeah. The, uh, that was the question. That was the question I was supposed to answer today. I think, yeah, yeah, uh, and and you know clearly I ducked it. You know, <laughs> um, you know I I honestly don't know how you change the world from what it is as it is now, without. I mean, the, the big question is, can can we substantially improve the quality of life for large numbers of people in the world, without significantly reducing our own? I mean, that's, you know, that's the big question. And I, I think that that's why there is such a, uh, uh, there's such an obstacle to bringing about massive alterations in the relative status of the world's poor, uh, is because we, we somehow sense that the only way we could really do that is to have a, a massive redistribution of wealth rather than grow our way towards parity in such a way that we grow more slowly than the regions of the world that are poor. Um, and um, so I, I don't have a good answer to that because I think that there's a whole politics of redistribution that is linked to this process that, uh, that seems to be the intractable element. Um, I don't know. Uh, if, you know, there, there's a lot of people who say, well, if we get rid of corruption in these countries or if we create greater opportunities for entrepreneurship, uh, that that will close the gap. Well, I, I think that on the margins, of course, that could, that those things could potentially lead to improvements. But if we're talking about uh, some countries where there's a, a 30 to 1 differential in per capita income, uh, something redistributive has to happen, I think, to really change that. Oh yeah, absolutely. What, what, what are the main factors that would account for, for example, those, uh, those uh, Well, I would have said whether or not you have oil, but Nigeria's standard of living is still fairly low, and they do have oil. So that would have been that would have been the the critical thing I would have said, though, because uh, certainly. Uh, I think that that's what distinguishes the economic conditions of many of the North African countries from those so south of the Sahara is this natural resource base which has made it possible for them to have higher incomes. I think specifically of a country like Libya, which has a very small population uh, but is going to be comparatively affluent because of, because of the possession of oil. Um, you know, other variations may be contingent upon the extent to which these, uh, these countries were colonies of settlement versus colonies of occupation. So the, the, the greater the extent to which they were colonies of settlement, for example, the southern African countries, you have, uh, you have reproduced the lifestyles of, of, of Western European whites among their white populations. So that gives you some variation there. Uh, but then I think Bio-Holsey's argument is very instructive. To what extent were regions of the country primarily uh, engaged in the sale of other Africans versus being the source of the populations that were subsequently sold into slavery, which produces some variation within countries depending on the regional divide. So y there, there are lots of possible ways to think about what what may cause these regional variations. But, but if we look at the continent collectively, you know, clearly it is a continent on average that is poorer 
significantly poorer than, uh, than, than the countries that we associate with the OECD, for example. Meaning what? In, in case you're the uh, amount of human capital as, as a factor that might lead to these variations? Yeah, maybe, except, <laughs> you know, this is real tricky. I've, I've, I've been thinking about this literature on, uh, on education and growth, right? And, and there's the theoretical literature now, the new so-called so new growth models, which emphasize human capital as the <laughs> factor that leads to technical progress, which leads to greater economic growth. But then if you look at the cross-section empirical studies on the determinants of economic growth, you find this real puzzle, that there's really not much evidence to suggest that increased educational attainment or schooling actually has much to do with affecting growth rates. So we've got this theoretical literature that tells us that human capital is a big deal, and we've got this empirical literature that's saying, not necessarily saying you shouldn't try to raise schooling levels, but that raising schooling levels doesn't seem to have much effect on economic growth. That if anything, increased schooling is a consequence of economies growing or having higher levels of per capita income, but not the other way around. You know. Mm. Oh, yeah, but, 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 the, but the thing is, though, these countries have, as you know, have such huge populations that you don't have to educate everybody. Right. So, so if you look at the aggregate measures of educational attainment in those countries, they're still very low. So what, what you're really talking about is an internal distribution kind of question. So now there may be, have to be a, there. You may have to have a certain threshold of of numbers of individuals who have sufficiently high education to to, to play this game, but you don't have you know, tragically, and it's almost tragic in a sense. You don't have to educate your whole population to do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got a question about the property rights. You mentioned the property rights as being somewhat important for the growth of British. Uh, no, I said that that's what, that's what Asimoglu, uh, Johnson, and Robinson were arguing, that, that, it's, that, that, the, that, the, reason why, that the reason why the transatlantic trade mattered was because it triggered a process of institutional change that inaugurated a set of property rights that made it possible for people to feel secure about engaging in entrepreneurial activities. Uh, yeah, but also somewhere, I think, in the literature, somebody mentioned that British has actually a little bit better system of property rights than, let's say, the Spanish or Italian. Was that just pure No, I, I, I think the argument was, I'm not sure about whether they were making the claim that property rights were better, they, they might well have been, were better, but they, they were definitely making the, the, the argument that you had a weaker monarch in Britain and in the Netherlands than you did in Spain and Portugal. Yeah, yeah. There's an argument about absolutism and non-absolutism. Yeah. Well, that prompted me to say, well, you know, why didn't growth take off after the Magna Carta is, is signed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there, are you, are your views comfortable with the observation some people make that the South was uh, turned moribund by slavery, both politically, both spiritually, and economically? Uh, and no. Caused those problems. No. No, I don't think so. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, the South might be moribund, but uh, but certainly not. Uh, it, well, I I mean, I, you you have a different view on this, but I, I'm not I'm not persuaded that the uh, why. Well, first of all, I I certainly think slavery was profitable. Well, okay. You had these rich guys, and then. But you have, islands but you have, you have country. islands of rich guys in all parts of America. You know, some are engaged in slavery, some are engaged in factory slavery, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, if you think about the the, the robber barons of the late 1890s, uh, uh, you know, what's 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 the difference? Well, all I'm saying is, at the end of slavery, you had no jobs for blacks. Oh, there at the end of slavery. There was a, 
moribund economy. No oh, but that's growing. because of the destruction of Reconstruction. That's, pre that's precisely why that occurred. I mean, had you, had you actually had this massive land reform, which we put under the rubric of 40 acres and a mule, had you maintained African-American political participation instead of having a, a, a period of, of white, white terrorism that took place throughout the South to drive blacks out of participating in the political process, you may well have had a very different history. One more shot. There was no industry in the South. All the industry was in the North where there was no slavery. Yeah, but the South was agricultural. I mean. You know, there's some regions of the world that have done quite well by being agriculturally based, like Denmark. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just a personal opinion. I know teachers have to do a lot to help um, the country work right now, but I think it has to be more um, to the government, how they work in the technology education. I think the government has to do more. I mean, that's the main reason why they don't develop. Maybe true. Today, you mean today. you mean you, you mean why why the disparities persist? Right. Yeah, the the existing government policies, but we also have to historicize how these governments got to be what they are. Okay, and and uh, you know if I if I'm thinking about the African continent in particular and the process of decolonization and the post-independence period, uh, one of the first things that comes to my mind is the elimination of those leaders who had the greatest degree of independence and integrity. So I'm thinking about the killing of Patrice Lumumba, for example. Uh, in, in, um, in Burundi, uh, there was a, 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 the person who was supposed to become the first post-independence prime minister was a man named Prince, uh, he was a prince, uh, Raguaswar, I think, or Raguasore, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. But the Belgians arranged for him to be assassinated. Uh, Belgians are kind of a no notorious about that. So, so if, you, if, you th if you think about it, you know, <laughs> there is a critique that can be made of the post-independence regimes that went under the, the, the title of the neo-colonial critique. And I think it has some legitimacy if we look at the process of how particular leaders were eliminated and others were installed. And so you, you, you have to ask the question as to why these governments are what they are now also. But yeah, I, I, I agree with you. We have time for two more questions. Yeah. Um, in relation to current outsourcing of wealthy companies, uh, countries to under industrialized and developed countries, yeah. I wondered if you would compare it um, more to a step toward redistributing the wealth, as you mentioned earlier, Whew. or would you compare it more to what you talked about with, with, with captive labor, labor because some people feel that mm -hmm. Yeah, I think why we have that debate is because there are elements of both at play. Yeah, that's a, that's a superb question. Uh, but I think there are elements of both at play. Uh, you know, in all likelihood, the outsourced jobs provide individuals in those countries with incomes that are higher than the incomes that they otherwise could have received. Uh, but on the other hand, from the perspective of the businesses that are making the decision to outsource, they are relatively cheaper than the labor that they would hire to do the same task in the United States. And so uh, there's an advantage from that standpoint to having a lower standard of living maintained in those countries. Uh, but, you know, so, so I think there's elements of both, and that's why it's, 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 it's a really, really hard one uh, to take a definitive position about. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, hardly any or perceived uh, raw materials, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. feeling that they have to compete against each other uh, in order to survive. Well, you're asking the question as to why they became attached to, at least in that period of time, mercantilist principles. Not necessarily, because here uh, their strategies differ. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Slavery, yeah. Any, any, any type. Make them succeed in the hyper competition yeah. that they face. Because but but I'm, I'm saying the, the notion of. Ever been a situation where the six similarly sized uh, 
uh, or in competition? Yeah, but but the, the hyper competition is in fact uh, the, the 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 cornerstone of of of, of mercantilist ideology. So so I, I think I think you 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 are saying, you know, why did they become so hyper competitive? I'm just saying that one of your explanations may be the explanation, but the explanation of why Britain could succeed with India is probably as strong or a stronger reason. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I thank you all for coming. I think about two minutes more before we leave this room, and I'd like to invite you across the hall for cookies and coffee and conversation. You probably have read the profile that we have in the program on Dr. Garrity. <coughs> Over 100 articles and 10 books. There's a lot of experience and expertise in economics. We have certainly, as a department and as a committee, decided that Dr. Garrity is a worthy recipient of the Alice Connor Gorlin Memorial Award for excellence in the field of economics. And I'd like to take the opportunity to present this to Dr. Garrity at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much.